welcome everyone and happy World Environment Day. This is so exciting. This is our first online event that we've run with WaterWatch um, for World Environment Day. So it's a bit new, but very exciting. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, wherever we might be. The Wurundjeri people, um, you might be somewhere else and pay my respects to their elders past and present, as well as to elders from other communities who may be with us today. For everyone who I haven't met, my name is Steele Hagens and I am the Environment Officer at Darabin City Council. So thank you again for joining us. I've got 44 people and um, I think some of you know we were booked out at one point, which is cool. Um, so this World Environment Day, the theme is biodiversity and time for nature. They have a different theme every year and this, this year's theme I think is very fitting for where we are right now. In Darabin, we're so lucky to have so many reserves, parks and waterways to explore. I think we also probably admire them, appreciate them and all want to protect them. I live quite close to the Merry Creek um, and I know that I've been exploring there a lot more the past few months um, when I just need to get out and go for a bit of exercise. And I love listening for frogs when I go out um, along one of the, the waterways and near the wetlands. So I think that our Froganar is very fitting for today's um, event. Today I'll be moderating the Froganar, or we're calling it a Froganar by the way, and Julia and I are both wearing froggy colours. Um, and Julia Cirillo, who you can see there as well, um, is from Merry Creek Management Committee, and she'll be our presenter and frog extraordinaire. So she is also the local um, Water Watch coordinator, and she'll chat about Water Watch a bit later, I think. Um, we've also got Gary, who is from our awesome libraries team, um, and shout out to the libraries for helping us put on this event and promote it. I think it's um, really good to work with them. All right, so lastly, before I hand over to Julia, I just wanna let you know that the Darabin Libraries team have got together some really awesome resources for World Environment Day this year. So they've got together some e-books, e-audio books and digital magazines, which you can access via their website and we'll send out that information in a follow-up email. But there are also some really good documentaries on their free streaming service called Canopy which you just have to be a libraries member to join up to. And I will hand over to Julia. Thank you so much, Steele. That's great. And yeah, please just keep asking questions in the chat um, and Steele will, um, will deal with those questions as they come up. Um, so yes, I'm going to be um, splitting this webinar. We'll, I'll have that a 30 minute presentation and then there'll be a Q&A part. Um, now, if you like, you're welcome to have your Frog Census app at the ready. So I did send a link to the Frog Census app that looks like this on my mobile phone, or you can have it on your tablet. So let's see, can you sort of see that? Bit tricky to see, I know. There it is there. It's got a nice big growling grass frog on the front. So that's a, a really good one to have at the ready as we go through the presentation. Uh, you can see my email address there um, to send the frog quiz later. Um, I work at the Merry Creek Management Committee. We're a not-for-profit organisation that's been around for over 30 years now. And uh, we are mainly uh, concerned about the restoration of the Merry Creek and the preservation of natural and cultural heritage. Uh, and the program I work under is Water Watch, and still mentioned Water Watch before. It's a fun-free citizen science program. So I work with schools, I work with communities, like today. We're going online. I'm normally much more in person. Um, and I do quite a lot of work along the Darabin, Mooney Ponds Creek, Edgars Creek, Mary Creek, and a lot of the wetlands around as well, and the, and the Yarra River. Um, and I should also mention too that I have an Instagram page. I don't, so I have put it there, the hashtag there, Mary Creek Water Watch. So if you want to keep up with other water watchy and froggy things, do go there. So let's, let's move on. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, you can see on that PowerPoint there, Save the Frogs Day. Now, it was back on in April, on April the 25th, but it's been going for 12 years. And the savethefrogs.com 
uh, website. It's a, from the United States, but there's some amazing research. They've collated all the research from around the world on frogs. So if people are asking about different frogs around the world, which I'm not very, I know our local frogs, but not really international frogs that well. So that's a really good place to go and check out more. And they do free webinars as well. Um, and Steele and I will be sending you an email with more details after the presentation of different resources. And let's move on. So this is what I'm going to cover today, which is great. A lot of people were asking these, these sort of questions. We're going to go through an introduction to local frog species. What are the frogs that you're likely to hear uh, around Darabin? Um, and we say here because we actually want to listen to frogs. We don't really like people going out trying to find them in their natural habitat because frogs are small. Um, they're very sensitive to changes in their environment. And if you're looking for them, you might step on them by mistake. Also, we want to we, we want to be careful of your safety. People going out into creeks and rivers and wetlands uh, after it's been raining, for example, if it's wet and slippery, you might fall in, get wet and cold, not a really nice way to spend the day. So the best way is actually to listen to their calls, which is what we're going to be talking about. And we use the Melbourne Water Frog Census app. So hopefully some of you have got that downloaded on your phones or your tablets. And we will talk about how to make your garden frog friendly. We won't have a lot of time to go into that today, but we will cover that a little bit and then further questions. So. Let's get into some frog facts. So as you probably all know, um, frogs are amphibians. And of course, amphibians are vertebrate animals, so animals with a backbone, like we have, uh, that breathe through their gills when they're young, so when they're babies or tadpoles. And of course, once they develop, once they get older, they actually have lungs. So they have that really interesting change or metamorphosis um, in their, in their um, biology. And they've been evolving for 400 million years, so that's pretty amazing. And, of course, there's lots of different types of amphibians. So you can see there there's a lovely picture of a salamander there. Um, also toads are amphibians. Uh, Cecilians, which are these really strange snake-looking things that are um, smooth. And um, I don't know if they're attractive. Like they're an interesting-looking animal. Uh, they, they seem to live underground a bit. Um, and, of course, frogs. But in Australia, we only have frogs. That's our only native amphibian. We don't have any others. Now here's a question on the quiz. There are over 6,700 frog species worldwide that we know of so far, but of course there's always more research and we discover more, but that's what we know at the moment, so that's on the frog quiz. But unfortunately, as of 2019, a third of these are threatened, either critically endangered or vulnerable. And frogs play, why we're so passionate about frogs, not only because they're cool and awesome, but they are really amazing in our ecosystem. They can tell us so much about what's going on in your ecosystem. We call them a bioindicator. So this is another question, I think, on the quiz, that they're really important because if they're not living in a river or creek or a wetland, we know in Melbourne, we know that it's probably not very healthy, that river, creek or wetland, because they can tell us they have a, they're a sign of if, if the creek or river is healthy ecologically. And if you take frogs out of the ecosystem, it really changes it. Frogs in Melbourne, and this is another question on your quiz, frogs in Melbourne actually have, um, they, their main food source is insects, so flying insects like flies um, and beetles, but they also eat a lot of uh, water bugs, so a lot of the insects living in water, so baby dragonflies, um, some mosquito larvae, which is great. Um, they also eat some frogs in Melbourne, eat other frogs, so some of the bigger frogs eat smaller frogs. Um, some eat fish. Some even eat lizards, little skinks as well. So they're definitely carnivores in Melbourne. But if you take them out of the ecosystem, it's more likely to have problems with insect plagues. So um, they really help us in that way. Now, I just wanted to mention this frog because a lot of people ask about the cane, the cane toad, which we do have in Australia, but they're not actually Indigenous or native to Australia. And you can see on this slide, which is actually from the Australian Museum, uh, from Dr. Jody Rowley, that they are quite, you'll see the frogs that I show you coming up, they're quite different, this toad. Uh, one of the things you'll see down the bottom with his feet, he has no toe pads. So they have these fingers and toes, but a lot of our tree frogs here have little sticky pads. He doesn't have them and no webbing either between his fingers, that skin between fingers and toes. So he can't swim or climb. So he's not very clever really, but he's clever in some ways because he's got these big glands, these big 
puffed up things behind his eyes that have a poison in them. So unfortunately, some of our animals that try to eat them like birds and things have died because he's, he's got a poison in them. So that's how he's protected quite well. And he's really, I guess, got bumpy, dry, bumpy skin, um, which is very um, indicative of a toad. So just quickly, I want to mention some amazing frogs. Um, there's some the wood frogs of North America, which freeze solid over winter, which is pretty amazing. They slow their heart rate right down and can live in the snow. So that's pretty amazing. And then, of course, it's a bit sad, but the gastric brooding frog, uh, which unfortunately is now extinct in Australia, but I know there's scientists that have kept their genetic material and are hoping to breed them again. They actually swallowed the eggs when they'd laid the eggs and actually the tadpoles brooded in the stomach. So actually they, they became tadpoles inside one of the adult frogs. And then basically the adult frogs vomit them up. <laughs> Here they are. <laughs> here's, the here's, the, here's the little frogs. So it's an amazing adaptation to their environment. Um, and actually an enzyme in that these frogs actually have that they produce themselves, um, it was actually used to treat stomach ulcers. So we used it in our own um, health and research, which is pretty amazing. So I wanted to show you, so those, this is also on your frog quiz, those that don't know any frogs in Melbourne or even those that do know some, we actually have 16 different types of frogs in Melbourne, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I'm going to go through some of them. Now, you'll see, unfortunately, three of them, we've got a little tag on them, a little um, triangle. They're threatened. So they're, they're much um, more difficult to see uh, around um, certain parts of Melbourne. And then we have a blue asterisk, which means they're introduced. So someone mentioned a green tree frog. Um, we do have them in Melbourne, but they are actually introduced. They're actually from Queensland. Now, why are we having some frogs threatened and some frogs becoming extinct? Well, these are some of the reasons for their decline. So there's loss of habitat. We don't have as many wetlands and rivers and creeks around that have the trees and the logs and the rocks and the clean water that they need to survive. The other thing is if we do have a few wetlands around here and there, they're not all close together. So Melbourne used to have an amazing, especially along the Yarra River and the Darabin Creek and the Merry Creek, these amazing wetland systems and billabongs and bogs and all these things that would join together. So frogs could migrate around, you know, get, get to know each other in different areas. And now that's not happening. So if a frog population disappears in one wetland, they would normally get migration coming over. That's sort of not happening as much because they're too far apart. Herbicides and pesticides, chemicals, things like that can actually cause um, frogs. Frogs are very sensitive. They breathe through their skin. So they can't actually, um, if there's herbicides or pesticides around those chemicals, if you're spraying them on your garden or cleaning anything outside, if that goes down your driveway and ends up in the drain in your street, that goes down into our rivers and creeks and that can affect frog populations. And that's the pollution. Other pollution includes after we have heavy rain, you might have noticed the Merry Creek, for example, gets really muddy. Um, we also get detergents. People might be washing their cars on the side of the road and that soapy water ends up in the creek. Or some people, I notice even some shops sweep out their, their shops and all that soapy water goes down the drain and ends up in the creek. So all of those things have a really big impact on our frogs. Of course, climatic variation, climate change. Um, we're getting milder winters they're not as cold as they used to be so some frogs are struggling with that it's too warm for them and then of course we have drier periods for longer and we don't get as much rain as we used to at certain times so frogs all frogs in Melbourne need water to breed introduce fish so you can see down the bottom of that slide I actually have a picture of a mosquito fish on the left which is like very related close related to guppies now, those particular fish are known to eat tadpole eggs. So if tadpoles, uh, frogs lay their eggs in ponds, these guys will come and eat them. So they're a really big problem. Now, the one on the right is actually a good fish. This is actually called a galaxius, which is a native. So we actually want them. And they look quite different, but some people get them mixed up when they, when they see them. And, of course, the other one that's a big problem uh, for frogs is the chytrid fungus, which has been around for a couple of decades and is very... Um, it's, it's, it actually spreads really quickly through the frog population. So if it's out somewhere at a particular wetland, it will spread really quickly through that population. 
and predators. So if you have a dog or a cat and, um, or uh, birds, um, there's, there's lots of different animals, fish, um, that can be snakes, tiger snakes and other snakes in Melbourne love to eat frogs and we have a quite a big population of snakes in Melbourne. So there are lots of animals that like to eat frogs, including other frogs. So where and why do frogs call? So frogs call to attract a mate so they can spawn or lay eggs and they, they, their calls different and they can, be, they can call at different spots depending on where they're likely to lay their eggs. So you'll find normally after we get a bit of rain is when you're likely to hear frogs call more because the male frog, because only the male frogs call, I think that's another question on your frog quiz, only the male frogs call and they're calling to attract a female. Now, the males are only going to call when the conditions are right, like when there's enough rain, when the temperature's right, and when it's clean, clean in their environment. If it's not, they're not going to call. You might hear a stray frog call now and then, but they're really going to be loud and a lot of them when the conditions are right. So that's why we use it. We actually use the frog call to work out where the frogs are rather than trying to get into a wetland or a creek and find them. It's best to walk along the Merry Creek um, bike path or the Derebin Creek bike path or walking track, stick to tracks and just listen out. And a good time to go is it at dusk. Um, but some frogs, um, like that picture there, the growling grass frog, they like to call during the day and they like to sunbathe. So you never know if you're out for a walk, have your phone with you and you never know when you might hear some. Now, where can I hear frogs in Darabin? So there's a number of really good spots that you can go. Um, so I've got a list here um, and if I get time at the end I have got some maps I know I'm running out of time now so I won't show you now but I've got some great maps from the frog census of where frogs have actually been recorded by other people but and if we've got a really great map too that Derebin has called the stormwater savvy map that's got some really good spots that you can go to as well so I'll try and remember to show you that at the end but these are some good spots here so the Edwards Lake Reservoir where we normally each year we run a walk and talk and hopefully we can later this year Steele and I run another one of those um, Mary Park Wetlands in Northcote, it's a really great spot to go um, here, at least three species of frogs there. Strettle Wetlands in Thornbury, that's also along the Mary Creek. And another great one in Thornbury on the Darabin Creek is Fezzes Wetland, which is at the end of Dundas Street, uh, which I think I forgot to put in here. Uh, Edgar's Creek Reservoir as well. So the whole Edgar's Creek section, particularly around the reservoir area where you've got Edwards Lake, north and south of Edwards Lake is fabulous. And Lots of spots along the Darabin Creek as well, sort of from south of the Darabin Parklands right up to La Trobe University. And I know that there's been lots of people hard at work in putting in more wetlands along that section of the Darabin Creek um, to help treat the pollution that comes in from stormwater, but it all, they've also provided great habitat as well. And yeah, check out the Frog Census app for reports. So on your Frog Census app, there's actually an area called Maps and you can actually see where people have recorded frogs and then you can go, oh, well, that must be where they are. I'm going to go and check it out. So, oh, and here you go. I did, I did download one map. So this is actually from the Frog Census and those black dots represent different um, recordings. So you can see next to reservoir, there's a big green frog. That's one recording. Someone's recorded something. But just to the up above that to the left, it says 33, a big black dot. That means 33 different people with their phone have gone and recorded 33 different frogs. So there's quite, quite a few around. And if, then if you go south of that, you can see a 58 near sort of east of Brunswick and just sort of south of Preston. So there's already quite a lot of information or data on the frog census. So we're always asking for people to continue doing that. And you can see there's lots of areas that are blank. We don't really know, like the heart of Preston. Maybe there's frogs there. People are hearing them in their backyards, but we don't know because no one's put a, uploaded a, a recording. So it's really good to try and, you know, sort of close those gaps a bit. Now, this is also on the frog quiz, life cycle of frogs. So different parts of the world, the, the cycle's a bit different, but this is Melbourne. So in Melbourne, I'll start on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see looks like a whole bunch of bubbles. That's actually frog eggs from a pobble bonk frog or a banjo frog. And the female frog can lay up to thousands of eggs and she actually lays them just on top of the water, usually in a quiet spot in a wetland or on the bend of a river, and probably has some branches or um, some grasses over the top to sort of protect them. Within 10 days, those eggs will hatch into tadpoles. And of course, tadpoles have that one tail and they, they breathe through their gills. Then tadpoles grow into froglets, or the other word we use is metamorph, and their tail shrinks and they sprout back legs, their hind legs. 
Then as they continue to grow, they get front legs as well and their lungs start to develop. So the gills start to disappear and they start to breathe air through their lungs and the eyes and mouth grow larger and the tail continues to shrink. And then you'll get the fully formed frog that can live in and out of the water as well. And as this slide says too, that most fro frogs will hibernate through winter. You'll still hear some around, particularly after rain, but it's really spring that they'll get going. So the best time to go out and listen to frogs is, is in spring. The moment's a little quiet. And actually there's a picture of a popplebonk frog that someone found in their garden and sent me. So let's meet some of the frogs. So what I'm going to do is, as I'm showing you the pictures, I'm actually going to use my Frog Census app. And you can feel free to do that too, because I won't be able to hear you. You're all on mute. And you go to the second section, which says frogs. And you can actually see, I don't know if you can see that there, a little bit now and then, it's actually got a whole list of all the frogs. So I'm going to play this one first, which a few people know about it. Um, this is the common eastern froglet. And um, if you feel like it in the chat, you can put in, I actually have heard this one. So we'll see if people have heard this one. Can you all hear that? A bit louder. So I'll just play that one again so you can. Yeah, most likely one that you're going to hear, um, hence their name, common eastern froglet. Our smallest frog, about the size of your little fingernail. Um, they're not very big, um, but they are quite tolerant, which means they're used to, they can live in a puddle of water pretty much. If, if it rains, they'll be there. Uh, and they're very small, but they're very loud. So you can see they've got that little bit of skin on the bottom of their mouth. They can actually make that bigger, like reverberate it, make it quite large. And that actually echoes the sound. So that's one of our local frogs. We'll go to the next one. This is a gorgeous little frog. He's called a southern brown tree frog. And you can really see that he's a tree frog. Look at his fingers and toes there. He's got those sticky pads and that actually helps him climb. So he can climb rocks, he can climb logs, he can climb trees, he can climb grasses. And he actually likes to attach his eggs or her eggs to grasses and twigs, not like the bubble bonk picture I showed you where it was floating in the water. These guys actually like to put them on sort of on top of the water a little bit. So listen to this one. This one's really gorgeous. And again, do feel free to put in the chat if you have actually heard this one. So the southern brown tree frog. Isn't he beautiful? Just gorgeous sound, that one. I just love that one. Very calming. So some people go, oh, I've heard that one. I thought it was a cicada or a cricket or something. But no, actually a frog. So we'll go on to our next tree frog, which is the whistling tree frog. Don't think we hear them as often around Derebin, but I think it's a good one to know because it could be one there's gaps that we just don't, people don't know about it so they haven't been recording it so again another tree frog so it's got those sticky pads on his fingers and toes and there is actually another subspecies uh, Latoria vari alpina that live in the high country that unfortunately are in decline because of those climatic variations but we definitely hear this one in Melbourne so have a listen to this one so So sounds a bit different to the southern brown. There's a southern again. Got them both there now. So the whistling is just a bit more high pitched. Where southern brown's a bit more raspy, a bit, bit, a little bit more low pitched, but they they are very similar in sound. And as the more you practice this, it's like anything you practice, you get the get get the hang of the different ones. So next one, one of my personal favourites. Now, I actually ran a frog walk and talk down in Elfington wetlands um, just late last year, and this frog had never been, well, not on the frog census anyway, had never been recorded on the app before, and we actually heard them. So that was really exciting. So the parent's tree frog, um, you can see it's a tree frog. Look at those sticky pads on his fingers and toes, really big, round, sticky pads. Now, this guy, he's a bit, he's, he's a bit bigger, probably one of our medium-sized frogs, probably sort of like 
half the size of my fist. He gets pretty big. Um, and he's he's more in billabongs and larger rivers. So that's probably why we heard him in the Elphington wetlands because it's near the Yarra River. But you never know. We might get them around um, other parts of Durban, say Edwards Lake, for example. That's a really big billabong. So I'll actually play you this one because this one's really distinctive. If you heard it, you'll remember it. So they sometimes call him the mad or the manacle cackle. Really distinctive sound, that one. Um, so if you hear that one, you'll probably remember it. The other cool thing about him is he's got these, if you ever get this close, which is, as I've said, quite difficult to do, amazing crosses in his eyes like that cross that cross shaped pupil which is really amazing so he's a gorgeous frog now i brought in the growling grass frog which unfortunately is endangered but they've actually been found a population's been found on the merry creek in Faulkner, which is not far from derebin so i think if you all get used get to know this call you may and see the colors because these guys like to bask in the sunlight we may find a population in Darabin, let's hope. Um, and as things are getting better, like um, the council's put in lots of areas to clean the water, lots of stormwater treatment ponds and wetlands, and we all of us are planting more trees and making more habitat, these guys could make a comeback. They actually like quite deep water. So they've been known to live in old quarries where they've dug out um, all the basalt or all the rock and, and made a left of deep hole. And if that deep hole's filled with water, that's where they'll live. So you never know. They actually found them in some deep pools in the Merry Creek in Faulkner. So you never know. We might get them back in Darabin. So I'd really like you to hear this one. He's very distinctive. So really distinctive. I think the first time I heard him was on the Darabin Creek and I thought it was a trail bike rider. So um, they sound like a motorbike. I'll just play him again. So he's really distinctive. Now they are a, a growling grass frog. They can climb a little bit, but they haven't got the same great sticky pads. So you'll find them swimming around a lot. They actually do like to swim in sort of deeper water and they're a gorgeous colour. They're also known as the green and gold bell frog and they do occur all along the southeast coast of Australia. I want to finish off with three uh, more common frogs in Darabin, which are the marsh frogs. So these guys, um, you'll know, some of you will know the pobble bonk frog, which is one of our larger frogs, and you've got the spotted marsh and the striped marsh. So marsh just means, means wet grass. So they don't necessarily always need to be living in a wetland, only when they're breeding, when they're having tadpoles. But the rest of the time, if, as long as the grass is a little bit wet and they've got a bit of cover, they'll actually live there. So the first one I want to show you is the spotted, or here, is the spotted marsh frog. So this guy um, is a little bit bigger than the common froglet, probably maybe the size of your little finger. And he's got some beautiful spots on him, as you can see. And the picture behind me actually is actually, oh, I'll go the other way, is a spotted marsh frog too. So they actually have really interesting colour variation as well. And they sometimes have that stripe down the middle is red sometimes. So these guys are pretty... You're actually more likely to hear them and probably see them. I nearly stepped on one on the wet grass near the creek once. Like just so make sure when you're looking, uh, walking and listening to frogs, watch your feet. I nearly stepped on in the poor darling. So they are, they're very likely to hear these ones around. So let me play you this one. It's really, it's, it's really not distinct. It's, it's just like a clicking, I guess, is the other thing. Um, I should mention too, I can play these. If you've got the app, feel free to play them yourself too because I won't be able to hear it. But it's only a short little clip, click. So it's a really, you have to really be listening when you're, when you're out there for that one, out in the, by the creek or the wetland. And this is another one that's very closely related, the cousin of the spotted marsh frog. Again, about the same size, but as you can see, he's got lovely stripes on him. Now, he does sound quite similar to the spotted, so you really got to listen to this one too.
So it's really like some people think it sounds like a chicken or something. It's just like a bok, bok, where the, str- the spotted is more click, click. And I just wanted to show you this great picture, actually. You can really see his fingers and toes. You can see he's not a climbing frog, can't you? Because he doesn't have those sticky pads. He's, he's much more adapted for sort of being on the ground and in wet grass. So that's another pitch, uh, question on your quiz about different adaptations that frogs have, like why some of them climb and why some of them stay more in the wet grass. So I'll, I'll leave that there with you. You can fill that one out. And the last one I want to show you, one of our, I think, a lot of us love this one and know him really well, is the Pobble Bonk or Banjo Frog. And see Steele clapping her hands. Yay! We love this one. Um, he is one of our largest frogs in Melbourne. Um, and he's almost toad-like. He looks a little bit like the cane toad, but he's much more attractive. He is, especially in real life, believe me. And he's probably about as big as your hand, like stretched out, like fully grown. They get pretty big. And a lot of people find them in their garden. So uh, that photo I showed was someone was wearing their gloves. They'd actually been gl- digging in the garden in their gloves and they found him uh, and they just put him carefully back in again. And it's great they were wearing gloves so they weren't touching him directly with his skin. But you can see, again, he's definitely not a climbing frog. Look at those um, really powerful legs and arms. They're really good for digging. So he digs in the garden a lot uh, and in the ground, but he's not going to be climbing anywhere very far. And so he does spend a lot of time, he and she spend a lot of time in the ground. And especially in our dry conditions, they, they've got some really good adaptations. They can actually dig in the ground and wait until the, the rain comes. And then they'll actually come out to a local wetland um, and they'll actually lay their eggs. So we definitely hear a lot of these around Darabin. So I should play it, shouldn't I? So if you have heard it um, or haven't, you can listen out. I think that's probably two calling there. I'll play it again. Isn't it beautiful? I just find it really calming. It's just a, a just a lovely sound. Um, so hopefully some of you have heard that one. Feel free to put in the chat if you have actually heard the Pobble Bonk Frog. Um, and, yeah, because they, they are, you hear them around quite a lot. Um, so they're just a, a beautiful frog. So another really good one to, to sort of um, listen out for. And I want to finish, I think this is the last one, actually. I want to finish with this one, which because we did have a question about Oh, well, an answer about, oh, we do have green tree frogs. This is the only tree frog we have in Melbourne, and they're not actually from Melbourne. They're actually from far north Queensland. I've seen them up at Port Douglas in their sort of natural habitat, and they are a tiny little frog, a little tree frog. So we have quite a number of tree frogs in Australia, and this is one of the smaller ones. So probably the, probably the size of my little fingernail on your finger, your large, your smallest finger, the nail on there is about how big they are. They're pretty tiny, but they have quite a loud call, so you can hear them. Now, these guys have actually been found in um, Fez's wetland at the end of Dunder Street in Thornbury. Don't know if we have them on the Merry Creek, but I know they're definitely on the Darabin, uh, Darabin Creek. And they call them um, banana box frogs. So um, when the Queenslanders send down their bananas and pineapples and other fruit that we're lucky enough to get here in this country they send them down to us nice fresh fruit and sometimes these frogs have been living in these plantations and they get they come along for the ride and then the um, whoever opening that fruit box of fruit goes oh poor little froggies I'll go and put them down at a wetland and and um, they can they can live on which sounds really nice but the problem is they they're not actually from Melbourne so we we're, we're still trying to figure out uh, what impact they're going to have on our local frog populations because they, they're surviving. Probably 20, 30 years ago, they wouldn't have survived because it, our winters are just too cold for them. They're far north Queensland frogs. They're used to warm climate. But because our winters are getting milder here, not so cold, they are starting to be able to, to live on. And they are an attractive frog, but, again, we really want our local frogs here. So let me play this one because we, we do want to know, use the frog census if you do actually hear these ones. Do record it for us. I don't know if you can hear that one very well. I might just make it a bit louder or play it on your own frog app. The weird noise, it's yip, yip, yip. So it's quite different to the rest of our frogs. It's sort of a yip, yip, yip sort of call. So it's when you hear it, it's quite distinctive. So, yeah, please do use your frog uh, census app if you do actually hear these ones. Um, it's really good. Um, oh, yes. Now, I had a question. I was going to, have we got time for this, Steele? Um, I wanted to play mm-hmm. some. 
We might be able to do one. Okay, one. And then, yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'll um, play it and um, I'll play, I'll pick a frog and maybe Steele, you can just see who answers it correctly first. So let me just pick one. I'll play a frog call and I want to see anyone in the audience, if you can remember from everything, all those frogs I showed you, which I know is hard, which frog it is. And of course you can cheat, use your, use your frog app if you've got it there. So let's see, I will pick, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey Loveland, oh, oh gosh, everyone going all at once. <laughs> Hey, Loveland got in there first, though. That was very quick typing. Well done, Loveland. That's fantastic. So obviously the pobble bonk or the banjo frog, huh? Now, the other thing I forgot to mention, they call it a banjo frog because it sounds like someone playing a guitar, like plucking, well, a banjo. Blonk, 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 blonk. So that's another way to remember the name, a banjo frog. Blonk, blonk, blonk. Well done. I wish we had time for more, but that's okay. You can practice on your own. <laughs> so just a couple more slides to finish off. Making your garden frog friendly. So these are some of the things you can do. Um, I really like to talk more about this, but we haven't got time today. But I think Steele and I are thinking maybe in the future we might do a more information on making your garden frog friendly and building frog habitat. Thank but one of the, sorry, let me just interrupt very quickly. Um, we have a gardens for wildlife program rolling out. Like we're piloting it in the next few months. So I'll put the link into the chat room and we'll send some follow-up information so if you need more information on how to get frogs into your garden um, that will be one way and then we could always put on another workshop specifically that sounds great steel and steel's going to put up a feedback form at the end too so if you want a frog friendly habitat webinar like this or in person if we're able to do that please put in the feedback form because if we, if we don't know, we're, we're not sure what people are sort of quite interested in. So anyway, making your garden frog friendly. Building a pond is a good idea if you can. If you're going to do that, don't put fish in your pond. Remember I mentioned that fish do eat frog eggs, so don't do that. Lots of logs, rocks and local plants, using Indigenous plants. And there's lots of great resources out there of our local plants that Derebin Council has and others. Um, Semi-shade. So frogs will need some shades. As I mentioned, the growling grass frog, for example, likes to bask in the sun, as do the pobble bonks, actually. But they need shade as well for those hot days and to keep away from predators. So things like dogs, cats and chooks uh, other, and other birds. Um, do try and sort of keep them away if you've got them. Don't use pesticides or herbicides in your garden. No spraying weeds anymore or washing your car near where the, the pond might be. Um, so, yeah, don't wash your car in the detergent, um, especially even if it's on your driveway and that's going down into the stormwater drain, as I mentioned as before. And frogs will find you. So some people go, oh, boy, I put this frog pond in years ago and they're not coming. It can sometimes take a while. And you might just have to check over these things again. Have I got the right plants? Have I got enough water? Have I got enough shade? All of those things. We'll send you some more resources as well, and there's some in the frog pack. But Mel um, the Melbourne Waters Frog Friendly Habitat is a great guide. And Gardening Australia with the wonderful Costa has a great YouTube how to build a frog bog habitat, um, which we'll send the, the link to as well. And I just found recently that Bunnings Warehouse has instructions on building a frog hotel. So that's kind of cool. So if you don't have a big yard, like a small courtyard, or um, you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I can really build a whole pond, um, you could make something out of pipes so it's so a bit like those insect hotels that people make as well so that's kind of cool and it's something the whole family can do together the last thing I just wanted to mention oh and of course there's some some lovely frog ponds as well uh, this one's up at the Whittlesea Community Centre so I have uh, been involved and my predecessor has been involved in making frog bog ponds and if that's something you're interested in do get in touch um, the last thing I really want to mention is the frog census. So that's that app I've been using the whole time. Um, we're really keen on getting people to help us record the frogs that they're hearing in Darabin so we can find out which species have we got. Uh, have we got some new species like say, oh, maybe the growling grass frogs here or the Perrin's tree frog and we didn't know about it. Um, and even knowing all oh, popper bonks are in, in much more areas than we realised. And also it helps us find out the gaps like, oh, we, you know, council might want to put a new wetland in this area um, or do some, some work there, but is there a frog population there? Or is there a, uh, an area that we could increase the frog population by building a wetland or something? So it's really good if we have the information, we can, we've got a lot more to go on. 
go on with. And of course, it'll help you with your own, uh, in building your own knowledge as well, which is really exciting. Um, and it really increases your own understanding of where frogs are occurring. So it's a really great resource. So do use that. I will mention that the Museum Australia has a frog ID app as well, which you might be familiar with. And that's for the whole of Australia. So if you're outside of Melbourne, do use that one. But if you're in the Melbourne, Greater Melbourne area, we'd really encourage you to use this, this Frog Census app because we, we use the information a lot. And that's pretty much it. So thank you guys for your attention and happy World Environment Day. And, um, yep, yeah, Steele will send you some more information as well. So I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> hey, Julia, we did have quite a few questions come through. So maybe I'll start with the questions that came through and then um, we can... It'll be like a speed round so we can make sure people get out by 11. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to write down who asked all the questions, but um, hopefully I got them all right. So my, the first question was, do frogs have ears? No, so they've, they've really, I guess you can see even on this picture here, they've got this sort of little, well, which way do I go this way? Sort of got a little pad. Actually, the dwarf tree frog had a better picture. They've got a little pad there so they can hear vibrations and, um, and obviously they can hear the sounds, like the females can actually hear uh, the sounds. So they've got hearing, but they don't have like big sticking out ears like we have, I guess. So they can hear and obviously the females have got very good hearing because they've got to distinguish the different frog calls um, so they don't want to mate with the wrong species of frog. So, yeah, so they, they've got, you can't really see the ear. They've got an ear pad, but they, ha they can hear. Yeah, thank you. Um, we had a question, what sizes are the different frogs? Um, and I know you did talk about some of them, and I was just thinking maybe on the Frog Census app, it, does it have the size of the frog as well, how oh. big it might be? The, I think it does, actually. I'm pretty sure each one has... Yeah, they even have the size next to a coin, actually. So even the frog booklet I have actually has them next to a, a dollar a dollar coin. So it gives you an idea. But for I guess the key is the common eastern froglets, the smallest, like half the size of your fingernail, mm -hmm. uh, of your finger, your little finger, um, and then the pobble bonks the biggest, as big mm -hmm. as your hand. So they can really vary in size. Yeah. Um, someone was having a problem answering question seven of the quiz, which is how can frogs let us know that um, a lake, wetland, creek or river is polluted? Hint what's special about a frog's skin. And you might have touched yes. up, I'm not sure if you went into detail on it. Yeah, I think the way I've written that question is a bit, um, it comes a bit curly for people. So really what I'm talking about there is that if frogs aren't in a river or creek, it means that that river or creek is probably polluted because frogs have very sensitive skin. They breathe through their skin. So if there's any pollution in an area, so if it's, it's really muddy or there's uh, soapy water from someone washing their car or there's herbicides or pesticides, that'll go through the frog's skin and then they would, they'll die, unfortunately. So if there's areas where there's no frogs, it's most likely it's because it's polluted. So by their mere presence or absence, frogs can tell us a lot about an area. Mm hmm all right, I had one that was, um, can you bring in spawn to a pond that you may have built or is it better to wait till frogs find you? Yes. I had a question before at one of our face-to-face um, -face events. Yes, no, it's actually illegal to um, transport frogs from one wetland to another. So if you get caught, there's a big fine. So instead, that's why we encourage people to build frog habitat in their backyard and the frogs come to you. So, yeah, please don't transport frogs around because remember I mentioned that chytrid fungus. You might be transporting chytrid fungus around, which means you'll be killing different frog populations. Um, so, yeah, it's very important not to move uh, frog spawn like eggs or tadpoles or or adult frogs as well. Don't, don't move them. All right. Um, Riley asked, um, they think that a common spadefoot toad moved into their pond. Um, can you talk a little tiny bit about them? They've never had one in their backyard before. Wow. Yeah, well, that's really exciting. And um, hi, Riley. I think I know that you um, work at Thornbury High School, so I'm assuming you might live around there. I'm not sure. But the common spadefoot toad, I've got a little picture here. Um, I don't know a lot about them because we don't get them a lot around, but they look very similar actually to a pobblebonk frog. And I can play that one quickly for people. Isn't that cool? <laughs> the cool sound. I've never heard them. Um, so if you have that one and you can hear it, 
please record it or if you see it and you can take a picture please do record it and put it on the frog census the frog census you can take photos as well they actually encourage um like photos of the habitat where the frog's living so they can sort of say oh the spadefoot fro toad seems to like really large logs or lots of water or something like that so the way you use the frog census just in the home button it's got a big record Ugh, i know you can't really see that but uh, no it's got a big record button on the front anyway so you can use that and um and start recording so that's a great one riley so yeah keep us up to date if you do actually have that spade foot toad that would be pretty i mean spade foot frog that would be interesting yeah um emily carrick asked what eats frogs i think you answered that one a little bit too Maybe. Pretty much everything. <laughs> uh, other frogs eat frogs, uh, snakes, all sorts of, all different snakes in Melbourne. We have like three or four species of snakes, birds, so kookaburras, other large birds, uh, fish. So a lot of animals will eat the tadpoles and the eggs as well, particularly fish. Um, so pretty much everything that fits, can fit a frog in its mouth will eat them. People, some people. <laughs> so that was all of the questions that I found as I was going through the chat, which was going a bit crazy. I think you might have answered some others as you were talking. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask Julia? I will, while you're writing them, or if you'd like to ask, just um, let me know. But I will also say there, there is another really great app called iNaturalist, which um, has just been, I don't know how long it's been around for, I think a, a little while. Um, but it's really user friendly. You can record or take photos of anything you come across as you're wandering around Darabin or Victoria or Australia or anywhere. Um, you can ask a community of naturalists to help you identify what it is. Um, I think it's a really, really good app, super user friendly. Mm -hmm. I'll put the link in the chat in case anyone is interested as well. Oh, now I saw Faye had a great question. Um, Faye asked, if I've recorded frog calls on my phone, can I upload them onto the frog census? I don't think so. If you've just recorded them in another app or just on the record on your phone, I don't know if you can transfer them over. You might be able to download the sound files and email them to uh, frog census at Melbourne Water, I think is the email address. So if you just Google frog census at Melbourne Water, there's a... Um, uh, email address but I think it's a bit tricky Faye the best thing to do is just record them on your on your um, phone because they want to know on the app because they want to know the time and the date that you heard them as well and a photo of the habitat and how many you might have heard and some comments so it's actually best to use the app but great idea thanks for the idea I had a question from Chris is there any frogs in Gippsland oh yeah heaps heaps and heaps yeah um gippsland is an awesome place to listen to frogs i know they get parent tree frogs they get the whistling tree frogs the southern brown tree frogs and they get a whole i think a few other frogs that we don't get in melbourne so um i've just been talking about frogs in derribin and melbourne but gippsland has a few other really cool frogs so if you're down in gippsland or any other place in victoria um use the frog id actually and i think there's a few i think gippsland might even have their own frog app as well um so please do record them as well. And um, yeah, that's, that's an awesome place to go and listen to frogs. So enjoy that. I'm jealous. That sounds awesome. I think I might do that. I'm going to go to Gippsland later this year. I'm going to go and listen to frogs. Yeah. Um, all right. I haven't had any more questions come through. Maybe we'll well, someone asked a question. Emily asked, she's got a few pictures oh, of yeah. frogs. Would you be able to help me identify them? I can try. Um, you feel free to send me them on my email um, address. Still will send out my email address um, and send them. I find it sometimes hard if the photos are really good quality and you give me a bit more information. Sometimes if the lighting's not very good and, and I don't know the scale, um, it can be a bit tricky, but I'm, I'm willing to give it a go. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I know it's hard on this, you know, if we're in person, it's a lot easier. Oh, <laughs> someone asked, uh, what's the app for Australia wide? Frog. ID, so just capital ID from uh, Australian Museum. Um, if anyone does have any frogs that are sort of in Darabin that they've found and they've got photos or sounds, I'm sure our bushland team um, and biodiversity officer might be able to help as well. We can always put the feelers out to see if we can help you ID it. Um, just feel free to email them to us. I'll, I'll give you the email and a follow up email to this frogginer. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Julia from Waterwatch and MCMC for coming along and being such an amazing frog extraordinaire. 
and also to the libraries for helping us um, promote and getting together all those amazing resources that people can um, download and look at at home. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So. Yeah. I just want to thank you, Steele, um, and the City of Darabin for supporting. Uh, without uh, the City of Darabin and all the support we get with the staff and funding, we wouldn't be able to run, uh, Mary Creek Management Committee wouldn't be able to run these sessions. So I just really want to thank you and for being an awesome moderator, mm -hmm. doing really well. And thank you to everyone who came along. This is such an amazing turnout. It's really exciting. And happy World Environment Day. Happy World Environment Day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.